Hi, everybody. So um, basically, I'll try to explain in a little bit more technical detail what uh, Courtney and Giga were presenting as one of the use cases of Origin Trail. And uh, actually, if you've seen the title of the presentation, it says uh, something along the lines of how we're going to be building the Google of Web3 and why we need the Google of Web3. So um, without further ado, because I have very little time, I'll try to jump in directly into this Google of Web3 idea. Um, so basically, very quickly, just to introduce this Web3 notion again. So in Web2, we actually had a lot of extraction of value from data. So some of the main building blocks for this to happen were URLs. You've all used them. Um, web search, actually. Google um, is big for search, but also other things. But generally, there's very few sites where you don't have like search, right? And then uh, this search enables you to discover some information, which in the end you can either read or write, right? So uh, basically, that's kind of Web 2 in a nutshell. And obviously, the problems are URLs you don't own, you really rent. Web search is proprietary, and that is consider search even like your Twitter feed, because that's basically search for give me the, f the tweets that I like. Um, and uh, finally, reading and writing, well, all of that is also very questionable because of the centralized infrastructure and very poor verifiability of information. We have a lot of uh, issues with fake news, right? That's one of the, the sort of um, effects of this. But generally, there is no way to verify anything. There's no information whatsoever on Web2. But however, that didn't stop a lot of companies to extract a ton of data from, from Web2. Uh, and I'll explain briefly how. But ideally, where do we want to be? So we want to be in Web3 where we actually shift the paradigm from data to assets. And what does this really mean in terms of those three things? So first of all, we want to own these identifiers. Those URLs, they should not be rented to us. They should be ours. So this is like a magical Web3 URL type of a thing, or did for some people who know what they are. But um, anyhow, um, we move from search to actually asset discovery. How can we? find anything, like, for example, medicines that uh, the previous presentation talked about. Finding this sometimes for a physical asset means you need some codes, like barcode, QR code, some, some uh, serial numbers on them. But you can basically pinpoint quite a lot of these physical assets. But there's no one place where you can go and look for them, right? So ideally, the Google of Web3 will be able to type in something or scan something, and will be able to find any object, a car, a painting, uh, or an NFT in, in the same interface. And then finally, we have this read-write-own paradigm, right? So we're, we're no longer ingesting and, and producing data that somebody else extracts value from. We actually own this data. We own the infrastructure. Actually, we own the identifiers. You own the identifiers. You own the, the, the algorithms that actually you control the, the discovery mechanism. And then finally, you manage and you trade what you own, uh, your assets, Web3 assets. So how? Um, well, basically, we at Origin Trail, our mission is to organize humanity's assets and make them discoverable, verifiable, and valuable. And I'll explain the two tools we use. Tool number one is blockchain. Obviously, you guys probably know what that is, but I'll just reiterate very quickly that these are trust networks. That means they're great for tamper-proof shared ledgers, great for DIDs, decentralized identity, tokenization, DeFi, generalized computation, really, trusted multi-party computa computation. You can put something some thoughts in a contract, and you will be sure that this will execute for all the parties. But what blockchains are not is they're not great databases. So um, if you want to query some data from a blockchain, you probably have to use another service. And also, if you want to put a lot of data on a blockchain, well, that's kind of like hindered by scalability. Even if we have a very highly scalable blockchain like Polkadot, it's not designed to do your SQL query, to do millions of rows of queries connecting multiple tables, right? Uh, it's just designed for a different thing. What are great databases actually are knowledge graphs, and they're sort of even better than databases. They're something called entity networks or semantic networks. So they connect things, entities, uh, via relationships. And essentially, Google created this term, knowledge graph, uh, and they described it simply as things, not strings. So if you're a developer, you know strings are basically characters. You have some sort of raw data. But uh, things move towards more something they'd actually call knowledge, actionable knowledge, or objects. And the, these objects get connected to each other. And basically, every major Web2 company has them under the hood. You maybe don't know it, but you used it. So Netflix recommends you a, a movie. 
that comes from knowledge graph. You do a Google search, that comes from knowledge graph. Uh, Amazon recommends you something to buy based on your previous purchases and previous purchases of other people. That all gets connected in the knowledge graph and even NASA uses uh, knowledge graphs to do all kinds of research. So with these uh, trusted uh, trust networks, blockchains and knowledge graphs, we made a combination um, and I'm gonna just briefly explain a bit how that works. So think of a very simple example of a knowledge graph. You're no longer speaking about data, you're speaking about entities. For example, here, Mona Lisa, which is in Louvre. So you have this little connection that's, that's actually between two things and then Louvre is located in Paris. Very flexible and it's great for semantic queries. You can, for example, ask a question. It can be a search, where is this? Or who painted the Mona Lisa? Or what is the historical price of, I don't know, some pair on Polkadot? Um, it's great for asset discovery. It's great for extensibility. You want to add something here, you just like add another connection. It's very simple, much more elegant than, than most of the usual databases that we use, particularly relational ones. And it's, it's actually great for even further reasoning and doing machine learning, but that's another topic. I won't go there. So combine those two and you get origin trail, the decentralized knowledge graph, which actually has two layers. So it's a global index of assets. They're user owned. It's an open system, permissionless, and it enables this asset discovery, connectivity, and exchange. Um, as I said, it's a two layer web three system that synergizes knowledge graphs and blockchains. And on layer two, we have the decentralized knowledge graph actually living since uh, late 2018 in, in mainnet. Uh, ran by over 2,000 uh, nodes hosted globally, permissionless, decentralized, um, by the origin of community. And layer one is basically a bunch of blockchains. You can pick, actually, which one you want to use. But if uh, I were you, I would actually pick the origin trail pair chain <laughs> because it's going to be the best made uh, blockchain for the decentralized knowledge graph. So it's launching, as Giga mentioned a couple of times, June 4th on Polkadot, but also origin trail runs in parallel also on Ethereum and a couple of Ethereum uh, side chains like uh, Polygon. Um, so um, having that said, basically, what does origin trail then do back to, to, to that story? We move from URLs to something called UALs, which is a primitive in the knowledge graph, which are actually uniform asset locators. So think of a URL for Web3 for any asset. User-controlled search, or really any type of query. Search is just like the, well, the easy one to understand. And then uh, this read-write-own ability of actually using blockchains and knowledge graphs together to take all of the assets, physical or digital, and actually work with them. So. We have a Web3 asset URL. We have a transparent, open set of algorithms to do search, which means also all kinds of querying. Think of your social media feed not being controlled by some uh, algorithm that tries to skew your perception into, I don't know, some political direction. Uh, and then finally, having these Web3 asset knowledge graphs, stick of your asset being part of that graph that you actually control because you own it, you're able to update it, you're able to edit it, you're able to sell it. Origin Trail, as uh, we mentioned, is actually used quite a lot already. So there's, I think, six uh, solutions that BSI has built on Origin Trail, one of which you just saw, the A-Trust solution, which tracks physical objects, but also there's tracking of um, uh, all kinds of uh, documentation, which are digital assets, uh, supply chain transparency. Actually, in Switzerland, uh, if you've been taking the train of SBB, SBB is tracking their uh, rail supply chain items in four applications on top of Origin Trail and basically making sure everything is safe. Uh, a bunch of other companies, like Giga mentioned, the retailers in the US um, and, and uh, food producers and so on. So it's already in, in use quite a lot. And uh, essentially what you're only seeing now are basically, this is the tip of the iceberg. We are gonna get a bunch more Web3 assets onto the world, assets onto the world of Web3, uh, meaning all over Polkadot and we want to help all of those assets be discoverable and, and obviously verifiable and valuable. So to finish off, this is, I promise, my last slide. Why we're doing this is actually to catalyze all of these network effects. And that's what these big companies in Web2 did. Google had won the search engine fight by implementing something called PageRank, which actually exploited the connections between websites. So the more connections between some websites, the more that website was relevant and that was higher in the search, giving you better search results. Same thing happens for all of these other Web2 companies. They basically leverage network effects. So in order to bring these same network effects with the same technology to Web3, but much better in a decentralized way, we do three things. Well, obviously, ecosystem partnerships. We're here for that. Um, connections between assets and users, very much like 
as I mentioned, for websites that Google used, many other examples. And then finally, cross-web tree interoperability, which is enabled by Polkadot with all of the, the great features that, that were mentioned throughout the day. And to finish off with a quote from our advisor, Bob Metcalf, who actually invented, well, has contributed to inventing Metcalf's law, as you can see it there, which says the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of participants in that network. He actually said, said this, I guess. Uh, you can read it if you want. Uh, but he's a big supporter, uh, and uh, he, he actually was, uh, if you don't know him, he was the inventor of the modem, basically the Ethernet, the first computer network. Um, and um, anyhow, uh, f uh, that is what Origin Trail is focusing on delivering for all Web3, all projects, enabling this discoverability, verifiability, and then obviously value for all of these assets in this future to be Google of Web3. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So I'll be taking some questions, of course. If you guys have questions, we have like four minutes. Um, and that can also be directed to Giga and Courtney, I suppose. Hello. Thank you for uh, your presentation. I was wondering, how do you manage uh, evolutions of ontologies or inclusions of new ontologies? Do you need to restore uh, all of your uh, UAL? It's a very good question. Actually, um, you, you should observe Origin Trail more of uh, infrastructural. So the applications, including ontologies that uh, they used to be built on, are uh, on the layer above. So the knowledge graph doesn't assume any ontology. It does give you these primitives, though. And for each asset on the knowledge graph, you have uh, uh, basically a user-controlled UAL, which is a combination of a did. By the way, I need to speak with you guys from Kilt. <laughs> but it's a combination of a did and a knowledge graph identifier. And then whatever's behind that identifier conforms to uh, some sort of ontology, right? Either schema.org or something, which is actually user-defined. So in order for the protocol to be usable in ideally any case, we didn't, um, we didn't specify anything. However, we recommend using, obviously, uh, ontologies that already exist.